So good morning, everyone. As I said, welcome to this Accelerate Information session with, uh, led by Peter Daly on good bookkeeping and keeping on the right side of revenue. We're delighted to have Peter with us again. Um, it's been wonderful so far, and it's great that this resource will be available online on YouTube afterwards. It's two hours, so there's a good lot to cover in it. But don't worry, because the access afterwards will give you a chance to go through any parts that you've missed. Um, these sessions are possible because of funding through Innovate Together, Rethink Ireland. And we're really appreciative of that, as well as the Arts Council, who are our core funders. So I will hand over to you now, Peter, uh, to begin. Great. Um, good to see everybody. Uh, nice to see the friendly faces coming into the room. The timing is perfect. My son and wife have just come home um, and are heading back out the door now. Um, will you grab me my phone, love? I just remembered I didn't turn it off. It's just in the kitchen. Thanks, love. Um, so uh, we're now going to embark on a two-hour journey of trying to figure out how to keep everything in good shape should revenue ever come tapping on your shoulder or just for your own <coughs> bookkeeping or for your own, thanks, love. Um, Arts Council, all these things that we need to keep track of. Um, I've got a set of slides that I'm going to use. Um, so I'll present them in the background and I'll jump from there to log in on to Revenue System, uh, both on my account and also on uh, Ross. Um, I'm also going to show you a very simple cash book on Excel that might be useful. Um, and I'm more than happy to share that cash book on Excel with ITI afterwards to disseminate however they like. Um, as I say, the notes, I'm going to give you the notes as a PDF afterwards. So that, and the recording is also available afterwards. So I suspect there's going to be sections here, particularly when I start talking about how tax works. That might just be a little bit uh, complex at times, but hopefully if you just let it wash over you and uh, if, then if you have any specific queries or you're trying to relate it to your own particular circumstances, you go back and look at the notes or you can look at the video at some point in the future. Okay. Um, in terms of questions and stuff like that, so <clears throat> I would imagine that I've probably given a presentation similar to this in some shape or form to some of you before. And what I normally do is I usually do it with smaller groups and I encourage people to stop me, ask me questions as we go, ask me questions about how it relates to their particular circumstances. In this case, because we've got a big gang of people, uh, we're not in a position to do that. So what I'm going to try and do is leave around 10 minutes at the end and try and cover as many questions as possible. Um, I got a few questions by email through ITI before the uh, before we started. So I'm going to try and cover most of them in the class. I feel there's one there. I might do a follow up with ITI and um, I might see if I can kind of weave it in. But if I can't, I'll do a follow up. So without further ado, let me share my screen here. All right. Great. Good bookkeeping for the artist and arts worker. So a bit about me. Uh, some of you know me, some of you don't. I am, uh, I originally became, I qualified, originally became, what am I? Uh, I qualified as a chartered accountant about 20 years ago. And having done that, I made the uh, sensible move to acting, uh, much to the disappointment of my parents. Um, <clears throat> since then, I've split my time between acting and accounting. Uh, I run a kind of a boutique tax firm where I have a number of clients, most of whom, or at least half of whom, work in the arts. So I get to see it from both sides, both as an actor and a writer who gets money through those sources, PAY, self-employed, but also then who looks after the tax returns for lots of people like your good selves. Um, oh, glitches already. One moment, please. My thing is not uh, moving on. I may look smiling, but the sweat is starting to dribble down the back of my back. Ah, here we go. Oh. Great, so feedback I've had from other sessions. The notes, people find the notes very useful because as I say, there's a lot of information here. You're gonna get it as a searchable PDF. So I wouldn't try and absorb all of it right now. Just know that it's there in the background if you ever need to go back to it. Particularly the calculation points where you're trying to figure out if you're looking at your own tax return, I'm going to go, how much tax am I supposed to be paying on this amount of income? I've got a table within here that gives you 25 grand, 20 grand, 40 grand, 35 grand, how much tax should be paid on each amount. People find that very useful. Oh, it's doing it again. Ah, do you know what it is? It's when people are entering the room, I think. 
Yeah, it is. So, uh, and another thing people find very useful is logging into my account in Ross. So I'm going to take you through logging into both platforms. A lot of people will have used these before. If not, we're just going to get a refresher course on it. Great. So revenues online platforms. They have two. One of them is called my account. One of them is called Roz. This is the sequence uh, you normally need to go through in your working life. So everybody with a PPS number can register for my account. So that's your PAYE platform. Uh, it's where you can go and move credits, where you can let revenue know about a new job, all that type of thing there. Um, I'll just wait. Sorry, Peter, I think you got muted there somehow. Unmuted now? Yep, back again. I'm not sure why that happens. I think it might be just the people coming into the room or doing something to the Zoom. Um, yeah, still doing it there. Okay. So, register for my account first of all. If you haven't already, make sure you do that as soon as possible. Then, and I'm going to explain when the then is. If you need to register as self-employed with revenue, and I, I say I'm going to get into the specifics of that in a while, you then register for income tax via my account. So there's a place in my account, which I'll show you, called tax registrations. You register for income tax then, and having done that, you then register for revenues online system. It's two separate things. Registering as self-employed slash income tax and then separate to that registering for revenues online system, which involves downloading a certificate as some of you might know already. Great. The plan for today. This is ambitiously what we're going to try and get through. Record keeping and having a system. How does income tax work? That's probably the most challenging bit. Uh, ways of getting paid. PAYE versus self-employed registration as self-employed with revenue if you haven't done that already when you need to do it and how to do it how you do a tax return both uh form uh, the easy one via my account and also the longer one form 11 via ROS. deadlines and penalties someone entering the room here we go again So sorry. Am I muted? Popular, Peter. You're just too popular. People trying to come in. <laughs> sorry, it's every time somebody comes into the room. I, I think I've got a workaround for it. I think I know what to do. Okay. But for some reason, nothing's letting me move this off. This is fun. We just talked about theatre for two hours. <laughs> when it's going to come back. Peter, do you want to try stop sharing your screen and, and restart it again just to see if that helps? Absolutely. The cursor's not even popping up. Ah. Doing something there. One second. How's that? We're back to you just on spotlight there. Right, okay. Do you, know, do you know what I'll do? I'll share the screen uh, with the keynote, but I won't use full screen for the keynote because I think that's when I lose my cursor. Is that okay with everyone? It's not too tedious to look at it that way? Okay. Looks good to us. Thanks, Peter. Not at all. Okay. So... Deadlines and penalties. That's what the next thing is. Then we're going to look at preliminary tax. Very quickly, revenue audits and other interventions. And I've done a little smi downward smiley face just to let you know the, the vibe of what happens when revenue tap on your shoulders. Uh, that, very briefly, just to touch upon it. Uh, artist exemption, very briefly. And then, in as far as possible, anything else you want to know. Diving. I have some questions in advance, which I'll try and answer as we go. They're printed out here in front of me. So record keeping and having a system. It looks so ugly with the slide subtitle not deleted. So the key thing is it has to be easy and it has to work for you. It's an individualized thing. Um, back in the day, before everything became uh, electronic and uh, automated, this did me fine. The thing on the left is two magazine folders. They're at arm length. They were at arm length in my sitting room. And I'm not being patronizing, but this is what I had to do. It took me two or three years to figure this out. I had to make it so that I didn't have to go and reach for it or look for it. So that each time I would just empty my wallet or my bag with P45s, P60s, when those still existed, they'd all just go in there. Credit card statements, bank statements, agency commission, everything in there. And then when I would do my tax return, I would pull out 
last year's one, that's why there's two of them there, last year and this year, we're always doing the tax year one year in arrears. So I would pull out last year's one, I'd spread it all out in the table and I'd start adding up numbers and getting things into the old paper form. When I was finished with the return, I'd staple everything together with a print or a copy of the return you used to send in by paper and I'd put it in that box on the right and I would stick it up in storage and I would take it out once a year to take out the one from seven years ago and get rid of it and then keep the last six. So that's how long you need to keep your stuff. And just to explain that a little bit further, we're now in 2021. So you need to keep 2020, 19, 18, 17, 16 and 15. It's six years excluding this year. Um, and that worked so well for me for such a long time. Had a great time with it, no problem at all. Then things became automated, things became much easier in my opinion. You've got um, your bank able to give you printouts or CSV files or Excel files that you can work from. Uh, and also you're getting a lot of receipts that are, you know, PDFs or whatever else. So, you know, there was a blend of both for a while and eventually then everything for me became automated. Um, so this is what I'm going to, what I'm going to show you at the moment is just an Excel spreadsheet that is a simple cash book. Now, cash book might bring you back to school time and accountancy and bookkeeping and maybe send shivers up your spine. A cash book is really easy. It's just you taking your bank, one bank account or a number of bank accounts. It has to be one cash book per bank account and detailing what each money in is and what each money out is. So I'm gonna show you what it's gonna look like. In the meantime, I'm suggesting you don't have to have one bank account. There's nothing that says you have to from revenues rules or from any other rules point of view, but it's very useful if you have one business bank account um, and you can set them up. There might be some extra charges involved. I think for the sake of 60 euro a year or whatever it ends up being, it's worth it. And if you can try and funnel every single piece of um, income you earn, either PAYE or self-employed and all of your business expenses through that one account, that means that at the end of the year, you're not chasing various different bank accounts and paper receipts you're just looking at one bank account and you have paper receipts and backup for a lot of it but you don't necessarily have to have it for everything um, and by that i mean like you know if you're paying your mobile bills through your business bank account you don't need to be saving all the pdfs you just need to know where to go for them if revenue asks you for them so i find one bank account is a good way to go and what you could do is just open up a simple extra personal current account to whoever you're banking with now. It doesn't have to be called a business account or anything else. It's just what you treat as your business account. So, oh, yeah. So prepare a cash book is a useful place to start. Not everybody does this and not everybody kind of has to do it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, new share this cash book, which is an Excel file which is here. Now, okay, is that clear? I'm aware that some people might be following this on a phone. Is that clear? Yeah, okay. See this bit here? That's just a data dump from my bank. It just gives me the date, it gives me the details, and it gives me money coming in and money going out. It might not necessarily give me these, uh, descriptions, but I've gone and kind of gone, right, that's what that is, that's what that is. Now, these are made of figures. These are not my figures. And basically, all the pluses are money in, all the minuses are money out. Your bank might do it in a way that there's a column for money out and a column for money in. That's absolutely no problem. But this is not me typing in anything. It's just me saving it in. Your bank might give you a load of extra columns that you don't need. As you can see, I have hidden some columns that I didn't need here. So this is what I am end up with. Then what I do is I just analyze them out into the income side of things, which is here, and the money out side of things, which is here. And I've color coded them just to help me, you know, track them all. All of these here, the first three here are self-employed income. So they're going to feed into my self-employed income and expenditure, which I'm going to go into in detail. That's my PAY income just to track it in one place. Then we've got my self-employed expenses, agents, commission, professional fees, motor travel and subsistence, rent, telephone, internet, research, other expenses. We're going to get into detail about what expenses are allowable. Then I just have tracked anything I've bought that's a larger item, a capital type item. I've tracked it differently because it goes in a different place in the return. I've got some stuff here that I may never use, debtors, creditors, 
you know, if I bill someone at the end of one year where they don't pay me till the following year, have I included my previous years, stuff like that. And then all the stuff that doesn't go in the return, money being paid to your personal account, personal expenses, entertainment. If I'm not sure of anything, if something comes in and it's got like one, two, three, four, five, and I don't know what it is, I'll just stick it in my little suspense column over here until I figure out what it is. And then I have a little check digit here just to say that whatever's over here has to appear at least once going across the page. Now, if you don't use Excel, I'd say that just looks like a load of gobbledygook. If you do use Excel or you feel like this isn't too ambitious, that's a really useful way of just tracking everything. So to go back over here, I've just got the money going in and out, and then I make a call on what is it. If I need an extra sheet, or sorry, an extra column, I stick in an extra column there and I go, okay, it might be like um, a commission on writing that I want to track separately because it's artist exempt income. And I might, you know, have commission, or sorry, not commission, um, royalties. Spelling would be helpful. And I might just go, I've got in an odd number of 683 for that hit play I wrote that everybody wanted to go and see. And I just go over there and I just pick it up there. And I make sure I've got a total at the bottom. I've got about four or five people showing up in my thing. Is that making some sort of a sense? Just give us a few nods or go like that. Got a half nod there. I'll take that. I'll take it. Okay. Um, and then having done all that, Having done that tedious thing of tracked everything and figured out what everything is, I then have this thing down the bottom. Let me just unfreeze these panes. So I then have this down the bottom. This is just a really simple income and expenditure account, which I'm going to look at again as part of the notes. And it just has income at the top. Commission is a new one I added in, royalties I mean. And these are linked directly up here. That's my income at the top. Uh, and that's all my expenses down here. And that's given me my total expenses. And that's giving me my net profit assessment profit. That's the bit that goes in the self-employed panel on the tax return if you're doing your own tax return. I won't spend too long, I won't spend any longer on that. It's just to let you know that's one way of tracking everything. It it means it's a bank account that is it, that ba balance there is checked against the end of the year. So I know I haven't forgotten ever, anything. If I have uh, spent some money out of my other accounts that I forgot to pay through my bank account, just include it in as a kind of a manual adjustment somewhere along the way that you can make sense of. If I've got paid and they've paid me into my personal account because I forgot to give my voiceover agent my new bank account, that's okay, just add it in. But at some point or another, if you manage to funnel everything into one bank account, life just becomes a little bit easier. So far so good? Great. Okay, going back to these notes. I'm going to take a chance on going back to full screen. I'm going to just... Okay, so preparing a cash book. Great. So if you want to go up a level, um, you, you can use accountancy software. I use Zero, which is an Australian company. cost me about €27 Euro a month, and they have a direct bank link. Uh, you know, it picks up the transactions from my bank account. So every time I open it up, I go and I go, oh, that's money coming in from that person. Oh, that's me paying a subscription to that. That's me paying my theater forum uh, subscription or whatever else. And I just post it to the account line. Uh, it also means I can send out invoices from that. Now I have a lot of small clients, so I send out a lot of invoices per month. So if you're just sending a lot of invoices, that makes a lot of sense. If you're not, and you've got one bank account, it's probably fine to do it the way you're doing it. Um, Expensify is somewhere in the middle. It's like a phone app that you can take pictures of expenses uh, and it'll track them for you. It'll produce reports for you. It's cheaper. To the best of my knowledge, the cheapest version they have is about six euro per month. I know a lot of stage managers and production managers use it because it's really useful for tracking expenses and grouping them per production or whatever. Or at the end of the year, you can pull out all of your motor travel and subsistence. Like you've taken a picture of your petrol receipt or whatever else. So that's another way. Revenue also has a free receipt tracker, um, which is you can save your receipts into Revenue Zone system. I'm just not that fond of giving revenue information until they ask for it. But that's just a personal uh, feeling. Um, somebody asked me in the questions about using um, 
wallets within banks. And wallets are where you're paying for something, say through Apple Pay uh, or through one of the other Android apps, etc. And like on Post has two of them, N26 is compatible with a lot more. I've never used them myself. And my feeling is that they're probably great as long as A, you can run everything through it. You know, you're not mixing and matching between stuff you can pay for on Apple Pay and stuff you can't pay on Apple Pay. Uh, and B, as long as it can produce a report that you can use, that you're not having to type everything out at the end. Hope that's helpful. So how does income tax work? You probably know a lot of this already, so I'm going to move through it at a bit of a lick. Uh, and really, if you want to go back over it, the main things I want you to take from that is that the Irish income tax system is uh, unnecessarily complicated. We have three different taxes that come out of your pay, income tax, pay related social insurance and USC. We have different points at which they kick in and they're all calculated in completely different ways. So you could go from one year having 40 grand worth of income and maybe six grand worth of tax to going to having 20 grand worth of income and having like one grand worth of tax. It like is going up in a loop like that or in a curve like that. It's very counterintuitive. Um, there's rumors or there's feelings out there that if you go a little bit higher, you'll get taxed more than you would if you didn't earn the extra euro. That is the case in one tax, which I'll go into. So I'm going to take you through each one of them quickly because I don't want to lose my audience. So these are the broad strokes, income tax. This is the one with the 20%, 40% higher rates. Um, this is the one that you're taxed at 20% up to a certain point. That point is known as the cutoff and then 40% above that. But to complicate things further, after you do that calculation, notional tax credits are deducted. Tax credits sound like you're getting money back. You're not. It's just reducing your tax bill. It can't reduce it below zero. Just keep that in your head. Tax credit have the effect of taxing some of the income at zero percent. And in fact, 20 years ago, that's how they did it. They gave you the first 60 and a half grand at zero percent, then the next chunk at 20 percent, and then the chunk after that at 40 percent. But what they do it now is they just reduce to take tax credits off at the end. But the bottom line, the key thing here is a single person with PAY or self-employed income or both a blend of both, can earn up to 16500 before income tax kicks in. That's the take home from this slide. It doesn't matter if you don't understand cutoffs, tax credits. It basically, if you're looking at your statement and going, right, I've earned about 20 grand, then you can take it that the top three and a half grand is going to be taxed at, taxed at 20%. Very quickly, someone with income, someone lucky enough to work in the arts and having income of 40 grand. I've deliberately picked a high-ish number so that I'm above the, the cutoff point to show you how the 40% kicks in. I'm conscious that a lot of people don't earn more than 40 grand. So the first 35,300 is known as the cutoff for a single person. It's taxed at 20%. That number is looked at and possibly revised at the budget each year. So that's a factual number you can go and look up. Um, so the first is tax at 20%. That gives you a figure of 7060. The balance is at 4,700. That gives you 1880. Add them together. That gives me that number that's hiding behind your faces. Less the tax credits. Everybody gets the personal tax credit of 1650. If you're PAY or a self-employed person, you get another one worth 1650. So you deduct that from the number. 8940. Less those two amounts gives me 5640. And what that tells me is someone on 40 grand of income should be looking at an income tax bill of about 6540. Sorry, typo there, 5640. That's me doing these notes last night. So to summarize that, income of 40,000, their income tax should be 5640. Again, that's the first of the three income taxes. Okay. There are other tax credits that you can get. For example, if you're a married in a married couple and one of you is earning below around 10 grand and you have kids, you can get a home carers credit. If you have medical expenses, you can apply for a medical tax credit after the year end and that will do the same thing. It will reduce your income tax bill. Um, if you have income that's below 16 and a half grand, there is no income tax. There is no income tax and therefore medical expenses don't make any difference because you can't get a refund of tax you haven't paid. If you worked in a PAY job and you paid tax as you went for half the year, 
and then at the end of the year, your income ta- your income for the full year is only like 13 grand, but you have paid some tax, you can get that tax back because for the full year, your income tax income is less than 16 and a half grand. Moving along, hopefully. So tax credits, I mentioned tax credits. If you're a PAY person, you'll get a certificate of tax credits sent to you by revenue. You can either pick it up on Ross or my account or they send it to you in the post. Um, the certificate details what credits you have at this moment in time, but most importantly, for a PAY worker, it'll tell you what employer they're sitting with. So sometimes you'll be working in a job and you'll be taxed to hell, taxed to, to heaven, and you'll go, what the hell's going on? And it could be the case that you've set up the new job with revenue, but your credits are still sitting with an old employer who hasn't ceased you off the system. So I'm going to show you how to fix that up now. For self-employed people doing a Form 11 tax return after the year end, you add in the tax credits in the tax return itself. So there's a tax return page. You just make sure they're all ticked. Usually that just means taking the the personal one, the PAYE one, and the earned income one if you have a blend of both self-employed and PAYE, and then maybe adding some uh, medical expenses at the end. If you want to find out about more about tax credits, Google it and go to Revenue's website. It's a big long list of them. And just dig in if there's anything that might be relevant. You've got a blind person's tax credit. You've got a, a dependent relative tax credit. You've got a tuition tax credit. If you've got people in your family who are going to college and you're paying the tuition fees, there's stuff in there that could be worth checking out. And for anybody who's in a married couple where one of you is earning roughly around 10 grand or less and you've kids, just make sure you're getting full advantage of the home carers tax credit. Other credits, medical tax credits, again, just check them all out. You can pick up the certificate, which is only given to PAYE workers, uh, or be, on my account or it can be sent to you in the post. This is what it looks like. Um, And as you can see on the second page, uh, the employer, I've blanked it out there, but the employer is who my tax credits are sitting with at a point in time. So if I look at that and there are two employers there and I know one of them is inactive, but the credits are sitting there, I need to go straight onto my account and cease that employment, which I'm going to show you how to do. So that was the first of the three taxes. That's the hardest of the three taxes. This is dead easy. PRSI, this is the one that gives you credits for job seekers, contributing to state pensions and other benefits. So this is the tax I feel it's always worth paying. This is usually simply 4% of your income. E.g. someone lucky enough to be on 40 grand at 4%, their PRSI bill should be 1600. There are credits available if your income is lower than 424 euro per week and you're a PAYE worker, you'll see that your PRSI bill on your payslip is not 4%. It might be anything from 0% up to a a smaller, uh, up to 4%. If it's below around 350, you'll have 0%, but you'll still get a credit for that week's pay. You just don't have to pay that credit. If you're self-employed and your self-employed income is between five grand and 12 and a half grand, you'll be hit with a minimum PRSI bill of 500 euro. That's the best tax you can ever pay because it's going to give you 52 class S contributions, which contribute towards your state pension and also job seekers benefit for for self-employed people. So if you ever have a really, really bad year and you're below five grand in income, consider making a voluntary contribution. Again, just Google voluntary contribution. I think I mentioned it later on in the slides. Just Google voluntary PRSI contribution. Once you go above 12 and a half grand, your self-employed income is taxed at 4% of the self-employed income. If you're doing a return, a tax return, and your income is on the lower side, maybe it's like eight grand. Uh, but So you're expecting this minimum 500 euro to kick in, but it's an amount lower than that. You're wondering what's going on. Are you still getting a full PRSI credit? If you have some PAYE income, you're being given a credit for PRSI paid on the PAYE side, so your 500 euro will be slightly lower. So if you ever come across that, don't worry about it. I've had that query come back a few times where people are saying, I, I want to be paying the PRSI. It's less than 500. Am I still getting it? You, you almost definitely are if you've got some PAYE income in there. So PRSI, someone has income of 40 grand, uh, their PRSI bill should be 1600. If it's not, something's gone wrong. And again, this is the second of the three income taxes. Oh yeah, you want to pay PRSI for the credits. This is me just repeating myself. You can check your contribution statement on my welfare statements of refunds request now at any point. So just to show you what that looks like. Um, Then I go. If 
if you don't have a My Welfare login, get one as soon as you can. Some of you might have a My Gov ID we well, uh, login, which is access to both My Welfare and also Ross, my account. Uh, I have uh, just a one where I go straight in through My Welfare. So it looks like this. Um, I'm going to log in. So I just check. You're definitely seeing what I'm seeing. MyGov.ie. Great. Lovely. Okay. Pop in here. So My Welfare, at any point in time, you can go down here and go to Statements and Refunds and find out more and request now. And this will give you every year, you might have to fill out stuff if you don't have a verified account, which is something, an extra step I haven't done with My Welfare yet. If you have a verified account, they should send it straight into your inbox and it will give you for the year since you joined the Irish workforce, every contribution you've made or has been made on your behalf or you've been credited through social welfare and um, it will give you them per year and what you want to see is you want to see a lot of 52s because it's 52 weeks per year and it's done on a weekly basis if you have a lot of 52s you're looking at a high con contributory state pension if you don't you want to make sure you keep it as topped up as possible either through work or through voluntary contributions between now and hitting the state retirement age at 66. That's a complex area and it's changing all the time, but just the broad strokes are try and check out to see A, what's your contribution record looking like at the moment? And B, is there any way you can shore it up as much as possible between now and 66? Okay. Back to this one again. Great. Okay, if you're not in a position where you're paying PSI contributions, you should make a voluntary contribution. Again, just check it out. Um, if you've been in the habit of paying, sorry, if in the last few years you've been paying self-employed contributions uh, and, and not, P, not, PRS, not employment contributions, then you'll probably be able to just make a voluntary contribution of 500 euro. If you are previously employed and want to make a voluntary contribution, they do it in a different way. They usually charge you 4% of your late, the, the last time you were an employee. You can check it out. You can apply for it and never do anything about it. Just send a letter off to them. They'll tell you A, if you're eligible and B, how much it's going to cost you and C, when you need to start paying and how. We're checking out. And you can go back five years for voluntary contributions. Universal social charge, the tax they brought in after uh, the country collapsed in 2008. So it only kicks in if your income is above 13 grand. You might recall I said income tax usually only kicks in if your income is about 16 and a half. USC is around 13 grand. PRSI is, is harder to call, but if you're self-employed and you've just got self-employed, it kicks in about five grand. If you're a PAYE, it's done on a weekly basis. But USC only kicks in if your income is above 13 grand. The 2020 rates are as follows. 0.5% on the first 12, 2% of the next 8472, 4.5 in the next 49560 and 8% on income above 70 grand. And if you're lucky enough to earn above 100 grand as a self-employed person, you'll be taxed at 11% on the bid above 100 grand. So if you're lucky enough to be earning above 100 grand, the bid above 100 grand gets taxed at 55%. That's 40% income tax, 11% USC and 4% PRSI. Just so you know. Um, again, these are going to be in the notes. So, you know, Someone on 40 grand at 2020 rates. They change each year. So this is one you kind of keep a track on. Um, 0.5% of the first 12 grand is only 60 grand, 60 euros, not going to break the bank. 2% of the next 8472169. But here's where the damage comes in. 4.5% 4 on the next nearly 20 grand. So the total USC bill for someone on 40 grand is going to be around 1107. If you have a medical card, and you earn less than 60 grand, you get lower USC rates. So you make sure you tick that box in the return or make sure revenue knows about it. So they'll automatically tick it for you. Um, if you have a really low year, apply for a medical card and you'll keep get it probably for the next two years. And then if your income comes back up again in the following year, you'll still get the benefit of the lower USC rates. I often see students coming out of acting college, applying for a medical card straight away, getting it, and then things start to work out for them uh, and they get the benefit of the USC, lower USC rates for the next two years. Uh, so to summarize again, this person has income of 40 grand and their USC bill of 1107. Again, that's the third of the three income taxes. To work out the income tax, you need to know about 
something like 26 points of information. Bonkers. It should be the first 10 grand is at 0%, the next 40 grand is at 25%, and everything above that is at 40%. Then we could get our heads around it. We'd know why our income was, you know, why our tax bill had gone down a bit, because our income had gone down a bit, but it's not like that at all. It's very tricky to work through. So the overall tax bill for someone on 40 grand is their income is 40 grand. The three taxes are these three numbers. Total tax bill is 8358, which happens to be 21% of their income. And their net take home pay is 31652. I'm often asked, somebody starting a new job and they go and it's a self-employed job and they've never been self-employed before. And they're going, how much do I put aside? And I don't know the answer to that question until I have a feeling of how much that person thinks they're going to earn overall in the calendar year. So this is a kind of a little, um, sorry, I just want to say those are 2020 rates and the numbers are rounded. This is a kind of a, a little table I have. Hopefully that's visible. But if somebody's on 20 grand, they can expect a tax bill of roughly 9% of their income. That 20 grand is after all expenses, and it's just presuming this person is a self-employed person. It's not getting into someone has PAY and there's some tax paid already. It's just someone who's clean, 100% PAY, sorry, self-employed. 20 grand, they can expect to pay about 9% of their income in tax. That person uh, manages to increase their income by 5 grand, which is just 25% of their income but their tax bill has almost doubled. So now they're giving, they're having to put aside 13%. They go to 30 grand and their tax bill goes up by roughly 50%. So now they're having to put aside against 15%. Up to 35 grand, 17% has to be put aside of every euro you earn after expenses. That's 30, that 40 grand is the one we looked at. That person is paying 21% out of every euro they earn after expenses, um, all the way up to 60 grand where Unfortunately, you're all sitting behind the, uh, in front of the thing at the moment, up to 60 grand, uh, you're having to put aside 30% of every euro you earn after expenses. That's a, I feel that's a useful, again, it's only at um, 2020 rates, but the credits haven't changed in 2020. The only thing that's changed since 2020 is the USC bans, and it's, it's not changing enough to make much of a difference. Those percentages will still hold. So hopefully that's a useful kind of a, a thing you can look back on if you're looking at having your, your three quarters of the way through a fairly big year and you know you do your tax return the following year for that year and you're going, I have no idea if I'm even close to what I need to put aside. So getting paid, I, I realize I'm telling people who probably know this already, but it might be useful just to cover it again. And I just check the time here. 1141. We'll go for another about 10 minutes and then we'll take a 10-ish minute break or another 10, 15 minutes. So you can be PAY versus self-employed. It's usually not up to you. It's usually dependent on the circumstances of the engagement. Acting in theatre is almost always PAYE. Lecturing through a college is always PAYE because revenue have told colleges it has to be. Design is almost always self-employed. Ads and stuff like that, if you're doing an ad as an actor, it's almost always self-employed. If you're doing film or TV, unless you're one of the stars, it's almost always PAYE. If you're one of the stars, you have more scope to negotiate a fee. Um, if a company doesn't operate a payroll, that means it's not PAYE and they look for an invoice. So PAY, very very quickly, it just stands for pay as you earn. Um, the tax is deducted as you go through pay slips and stuff like that. You can let revenue know you're starting a new job via my account. You can also cease an employment and move your credits between two or more active employers on my account. My account's only been around for a number of years and it can be a bit of a pain to negotiate at times, but it actually is quite useful as long as your situation is not too complex. Um, in terms of my account as well, the, uh, you can also tell revenue, know about other non-PAYE income. For example, somebody asked me about somebody who was a former PAYE employee and they have a small amount of non-PAYE income. You can let revenue know about that through the income tax return on my account. You can also claim back medical expenses and overpayments of PAYE. So I'm now going to log into my account to let you know what it looks like. So my account, like Ross, can be accessed via Revenue's website. It's up here. I'm going to sign in to my account. And my wife, Lauren, has allowed me to log in as herself 
because she, I have an, a self-employed registration, so I can't do some of the things that Lauren can do on my account. Avert your eyes. Oh, um, there's some more. More or less. Fuck off. Ah, come on, give me a break. About 100 people looking at me. It's in the middle. Thank you. Okay, so this is what my account looks like. It's a nice, friendly, lots of different colors and stuff like that, uh, unlike Ross, which is much more uh, intimidating, I feel. So I think some of the useful things we look at in my account are uh, looking at letting revenue know you've got a new job. So you just go to manage your tax. You can also do it here. Manage your tax 2021. And I can go add a job. And I'm going to go, I'm starting a new job next Monday. And I want to let them know I'm doing it on the Wednesday before so I can check that they haven't messed it up before I start. I go start. All I need, I need to check to see, are there any active employments here? And there aren't. That's been ceased. If that wasn't ceased and I knew that job had come to an end, I would cease it. It would give me the chance to cease it here. So that's what you'd always do to make sure that your tax credits don't stay with the old employer. If you don't cease it, they'll automatically stay with the old employer. If you've got two different jobs happening at the same time, you can set up the new one and then you can send an email to Revenue to ask them how to split the credits between them. But for now, I don't need to worry about that because I have no other active employments. So I'll go add new job and I'll go. I'm going to pretend that Lauren's going to start working for me. I'm an employer uh, on next Monday, which is around the 26th of April, something like that. Oh, fourth, 2020. I'm going to say that even if I'm not sure, I'm just going to say weekly paid. It really doesn't make any difference. Lauren doesn't own the company she's about to start working for. That's what that one means, proprietary director. I click next. This is key for anybody who's an actor. I'm going to let them know, A, that I'm an actor because I get an extra flat rate expense. I'm going to go down the bottom here, click next, and then I'm going to go freelance actor. They just ask you to pick this, it again because in some of the other professions, there's a choice of options. So it's a default that it gives you this second page. So I'll go next. This is where it's asking me, do I think all the jobs that I do slash Lauren does in 2021 is going to be above 13 grand? They're trying to figure out if they need to tell your employer to deduct USC or not deduct USC. If you're not sure that, and you think you might go above 13 grand, I would just tick the second one. I expect it to be more than 30 grand. If it turns out you earn less than 30 grand, you can get the USC you paid back by doing a review and income tax return through my account. So I'll say next, I'll check my details. So starting next Monday or whatever it is, that's day. Yeah, all looks good. I tick that and as with everything with revenue, nothing happens until you put in your password, which of course I won't do now. So that's how you start a new job. And key to that is, <coughs> excuse me, that's how you uh, get rid of an old job. Just go in and cease it. Um, and that'll do that for you. Other things you can do in my account. You can, um, if you've been working in a PAY job and earned some, paid some tax, and now you're finding yourself in a period of unemployment and you're not on or say even if you are on the pub, you can go and claim uh, a repayment of the tax you paid. You have to leave it a period of time, uh, but you make your claim, claim your unemployment repayment in here. So that's not possible for Lauren because she hasn't paid any PAY in 2021. Um, you can go in to manage, to review your tax, but I'm going to do that later on in the session. So. Uh, Great. So being self-employed, in fact, do you know what? Now might be a good, as good time as any to uh, take a little break and uh, gather our senses and our thoughts and um, see you back here around 12 o'clock. Great, we're back recording again. So let's all put on our serious voices again. Okay, during the break, some people come up with some very useful questions and I wanted to cover a few of them before uh, we get stuck back in the notes again. So uh, 
Somebody has said they're looking at their peer side contributions and they have two questions. There are a few columns, contributions and reckonable contributions. What is the difference? Also, none of the columns add up to 52. Is this sufficient to say that I'm up to date? Okay, when you look at this letter, if you've never looked at this letter before, this is a little bit abstract, but when you do look at this letter, it's going to have a number of years on the left-hand side and then to the best of my memory, four rows of columns, three or four. It's the second from the right is the most important one. Those are the paid reckonable contributions. Those are the ones that you've paid through uh, working or through other things like that. Reckonable contributions where you've been credited contributions, I think it's usually through social welfare. You can add the both together, but what you need to do is take a look at the, co the number of contributions you have, then go and look at the rules. And as somebody pointed out, you need to have like 520 paid contributions and those have to be paid then you can have like after that you have to have a certain number of you need to have like uh can't remember the, the details after that but you need to have started paying before you're 55 all these different things but it's the second last column is the most important one and they're saying none of the columns add up to 52 in each of the years you can have the maximum number you can have 52 if there are no 52 showing up it means that you have less than 52 contributions per year and that just, it might be an indication that you should try and get that up to 52. If you have at least five grand of self-employed income and a triggered 500 euro PSI bill, that would give you 52 class S for that year. And that's the easiest way to make sure those contributions are looking good for, uh, going forward. Um, okay, I'm gonna, uh, for the rest of the questions, I'm gonna pick them up as I go through. Uh, somebody's asked, my old pal, I won't say her name, has asked a quickie on the Form 11, it is my self-employed PAY, but I don't think you ever registered a self-employed. You must have done that at some point, or even it was done automatically for you if you ever filled in a paper Form 11. So you don't need to go back and do anything. In fact, if you weren't registered as self-employed, uh, you wouldn't be able to open up a Form 11 on Ross. She's nodding. She didn't give me a thumbs up. Love it. Okay, back to this malarkey. Um... So self-employed, uh, we've just gone through PAY people. Um, at the, for a self-employed person, um, and I'm going to come to a point where I bring the two together, PAY and self-employed, but this is just getting your head around the self-employed. So at the end of the tax year, you need to pull all your income and expenses together. Prepare a simple income and expenditure account. Income less allowable expenses will give you your taxable profit. That looks something like this. Hopefully that's not too small on the screen. It's what I showed you before on the Excel spreadsheet. Um, and it's just income at the top. You can do it whatever way you like. Um, this is a personal document. You don't give this to revenue. It's just if they ever ask you any questions, they, this is where you've come up with your numbers. From revenue's perspective, all they see is your total income, which in this person's case is 27,500. And then you see the boxes at the bottom. They ask for those a question they asked for those categories specifically and they've asked for more and more over the last couple of years for example they never asked for rent before and they've asked it for the first time in the 2020 tax return so what i do is i link up those i list motor travel and subsistence as a line up there underneath that i've got subcontractors which could be people who are working for you say for example you got an arts council grant and you got 15 grand to do a development of a play, but you paid 10 grand to other people, then you've got 10 grand worth of subcontractors. Rent is what it is. It could be rent for a studio space, or it could also be a share of your home rent. Um, repairs and renewals is where you're buying like small pieces of equipment, the renewals part. They just want to make sure people are not taking the piss and including larger items in their renewals. That's the only reason they ask for that. Um, professional fees in this case is going to be uh, agents commission and also maybe accountancy fees. Uh, and then other expenses is everything else. So that's what you're looking to pull together at the end of the year. If that's a useful tool to kind of corral everything into one place. And, you know, this might take a couple of goals. You might start at the start of, you know, you might start pulling this together in February and get some of it down and then have another look through your bank statements and remember that, oh, you got that fee for that ad in September. You know, don't try and do this all in the one go. This is probably a useful conversation to go through, uh, which is... Oh, stuck again. Forgive me. Ah, here we go. Sorry, folks. Right. Okay. What's tax deductible? Okay. So 
These are just my categories. And as I said, some of them revenue asked for specifically. I'm going to whiz through these because I'm conscious of time a little bit, although we're not doing too bad. Motor travel and subsistence. The reason revenue asked for this specifically is because they've got a lot of rules around it. There are three elements to that sentence, motor, travel, and subsistence. Motor is all things correlated. My advice to somebody in working in the arts who has like different amounts of travel each year is to do something like this and who drives a car. Take track every penny you spend on the car in a year. And that includes every penny you spent on petrol, your car insurance, your car tax, your car services and your NCT. Add it all up together and then apply an appropriate business percentage. So in a year where you're driving all over the place for self-employed jobs only, you can't claim any of this on PAY jobs. It just has to be self-employed. So it can be voiceovers. It can be ads. It can be workshops. It can be teaching. It can be a theater job where you got paid a fee. Look at the, the income and go, well, what's a reasonable percentage? If you've got one voiceover for a thousand euro, your percentage is going to be very, very low. Might be 5%. That might even be pushing it. But if you've been all over the place and you've got buckets of self-employed income and tons of voiceover work, which is always self-employed, then you might just look at it taking a much higher percentage. Revenue are actually, they expect you to track your mileage and be able to stand over it. So if you're feeling that you want to have something to stand over, but you can't, I mean, you know, you can do that. Great. You know, track every single journey you went to and every single personal journey and take a proper percentage. But, you know, for people who are not earning a fortune, they will accept an approximation. I know there's been recorded and I hope nobody from Revenue ever comes back and says anything different. That's one way of doing it. And I think that's the most useful. It just takes the headache away from you. The other way to do it is to like just track, just keep the petrol receipts for jobs you went on and then take a portion of the other costs. But the main thing there is that, you know, if you're using your car for work, you should be able to use car insurance, a bit of car insurance, a bit of car tax and stuff like that. Now, I'm not going to get into the conversation about letting your insurer know you're using your car for work because that's a disaster. So all I'm talking about is the tax side of things. Travel is everything that isn't a uh, motor, and it also includes like accommodation, stuff like that. That could be the same if you're talking about using the Lewis and bus and stuff like that, but you're using it all the time. You're topping up, and sometimes it's personal, sometimes it's self employed work, sometimes it's PAYE. Again, you could just track it all and take an appropriate percentage. You'll know by looking at your income perhaps what's an appropriate percentage. Again, if you've got not much self-employed income, I'm not expecting to see much in that line. Then separate to kind of taking a percentage of that, there might be specific journeys you've taken and accommodation you've paid for, for specific self-employed jobs or conferences and stuff like that. Just track those separately and include them in there. Um, subsistence is the, the trickier part. Revenue have a blanket a uh, first line they give you about food and they say everyone has to eat to live and therefore food is not a business expense so they don't expect to see any food in your tax return but then three pages deep in the guidance they say if you stay in a hotel for work and they usually mean like visiting a client and working with them or going to belfast to do a two-day radio play that's been paid as a fee and you've had to pay for your own accommodation and it doesn't happen like that at that point then and there's food included on the hotel bill, they'll allow you to use that food. Now, I think that's very narrow. So what I say to clients is say, look, if you're away for work and you're having to pay for your own accommodation and food, and it's not a massive number, let's just include it. If revenue do come back and look at it, they might take it out. But if they do, and it's not massive, the adjustment's going to be really small. And that's the bottom line here. Revenue don't come in, look at your return, and if there are any mistakes, hit you with a huge penalty. They look at if there are any mistakes, there's always going to be mistakes. And if the mistakes are small and it's not a deliberate mistake, like you haven't deliberately left off 10 grand worth of expense, uh, income, then they usually might hit you with either no penalty or 15% of the tax. So, you know, if you've, if you've included food at 200 euro, it saved you 60 euro of tax and it shouldn't be there. They take it out. They charge you the 60 euro plus an extra 20 euro. It's not the end of the world. So do look at this as a kind of a materiality game. Don't look at it as a looking for an A in a maths exam. You're just looking to pass. So I hope that helps. Subsistence could also include like bottle of water in a coffee shop where you're learning your lines or a cup of coffee where you're meeting someone. Um, but it can never include business entertainment where you've brought somebody for a lunch to discuss the job you're going to work on together. That's specifically disallowed. Now, even though it's legitimate, it's a legitimate business expense. It's not a tax deductible expense. Subcontractors, I've just gone through. It's like everybody you're paying to help you do what you do. 
Telephone and internet, what I often say to people is, look, let's take either all, if you're doing a lot of self-employed income, um, there's a lot of self-employed activity and there's a lot of income, let's take a really high percentage of your mobile, maybe 100%, maybe 90, maybe 75. If you're not doing much, let's take a lower percentage and let's maybe take 50% of your home internet. Um, rent, that could be if you've got a studio space or something like that, you're actually paying rent to do your job. That's totally 100% level. If not, you could take a portion of your home rent Revenue, say, if, you're, if you've got a spare office to work from, then you can take a portion of your home rent. Who has that these days living in Dublin? What I would say to clients is, look, you know, if you want to take a small chance, a small risk, we could take a percentage of your rent. You know, if you could argue legitimately that you would have paid 600 for rent, but you've got a bigger bedroom because you've got a desk in the corner and that premium is 100 euro per week, 100 euro per month, maybe we could take that extra 100 euro. Again, there's always risk with that one that if revenue did have a look and they took it out, there might be an adjustment. But again, you're looking at how much would that adjustment really be. Light and heat, you might again take a small percentage of your light and heat because you're working from home. If you're a self-employed person and all of your self-employed income is voiceovers in town, you can't really argue a high light and heat. But if you're a writer working from home um, and you've got a spare office and you need your light and heat on, you can take a bigger percentage. It's all about being able to justify it and argue for it if the question ever comes. Research, you know, that's tickets to go and see stuff, just tickets for you, no entertainment, you haven't paid for anyone else. Uh, it could be books, it could be stuff like that, it could be watching shows online. Again, I have a revenue audit for a uh, drama teacher one time and the revenue uh, inspector refused to take theatre tickets into account. They just said, no, that's entertainment. And I said, look, it's, it's legitimate, it's keeping up to date with contemporary practices and they were just refused. And at that point, it didn't make any difference to this client, it didn't make much of a difference. So, and we were arguing in other cases, so we just dropped it. So there is always a little bit of risk. Um, the main thing I would say is just, you know, don't take the piss with it, don't include just everything. But you know, if you're an Irish writer, performer, producer, I feel going to see shows is a legitimate uh, and going to see Irish films is totally legitimate. And if you want to push it further, push it further. Dues and subscriptions could be industry specific. It could be theatre forum. It could be equity spotlight, but it could also be um, your, your Microsoft Office, your fire software, all that stuff. Uh, insurance, some producers on the call here or people who are putting work together, of course, that's a legitimate business expense. Any training you've done, and um, people, if you're paying me to help you, accountancy, other professional fees, you might have got somebody else to um, do a sensitivity reading on your new script. Um, repairs and renewals is like repairs on equipment, but also smaller items that you're not writing off over longer. And then sundries, everything else. You know, you could have stuff that sometimes pops up. It could be, it could, they could, people could automatically include it in their office costs, or they could come back to say to me, listen, I had to get a new MacBook cable charger cost me 120 euro, can I include that? Of course you can. If you're using your laptop for business purposes, of course you can. What's not included in these expenses is larger items. They got written off over a longer period. They get written off over eight years in a different place in the return. It's called a capital allow allowance. What I would say to people is that, that could be like, if you've spent more than a grand on something that's gonna last you for longer than one year, maybe have a think about writing it off over eight years rather than including it in here. Or you could just go, no, who's got time for that and just include it in there and take a chance that if revenue did look at it, they would just move it off over eight years. It's not going to make a massive difference. Hopefully that made some sort of a sense. The simple Peter, cash... Yes. There, were, there were a couple of questions that were kind of related to the allowable expenses there. Absolutely. I wonder... If now is a good time, yeah. Yeah, if, if now is a good time to just go through a couple of them. Um, yeah. So just a question about taxis, actually, if, you're, yeah. if you don't drive. Yeah, my feeling is that taxis is the same as taking a train to a specific job. Yeah, absolutely. Just keep record of it. If it's useful, maybe just note what it was for or whatever else. I mean, rev revenue might ask you what it's for, but they might. So, yeah, absolutely. And a useful tip, which is that looking at journeys on Google Maps to see the mileage as well, if you, you know, to track that. Great. Yeah, that's exactly. Good yeah. yeah, that's good. Um, yeah. And then regarding motor expenses, as a self-employed person, can I claim any of the cost of buying a car as an example? Yes, a really good question. And I feel, yes, you can. But it's not that straightforward. Um, you have to look at the emissions on the car. Um, there's a load of rules around this whole area. If you, if you were lucky enough to be able to afford a brand new car and it cost you 30 grand and the emissions were good, you would get a write-off, but it would be capped at 24 grand. That just happens to be the upper limit on this. Uh, 
So say, for example, you bought a second-hand car and the emissions were okay and it cost you 15 grand. The first thing you do is you take the 15 grand and you multiply it by your business usage mileage. So you've already done that exercise for your petrol and say you've decided 25% is how much I'm using the car for work. You take the 15 grand, multiply it by 25% and then take a one-eighth right off of that. If you're using your car a lot for work, it'll be a much higher percentage. If you're not using it much at all, it'll be a much lower percentage. Does that make sense? Um, and then I had a specific question, which is about the maintenance for mobility aids, particularly rubber tips. It <laughs> technically is a way of transport, and would that be an allowable expense? I feel it is, yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, and then, John, is rent and working from home? I presume yeah. you're wondering about those things being included. Yeah, so rent and working from home. Is this, Dawn, is this as a self-employed person or as a PAYE person? Um, and, and while I'm somebody is, um, uh, or while John is maybe thinking about answering that, either through the chat or whatever, um, I'll just ask another one that came in privately. Can you take a proportion of your mortgage's rent expense? No, you can't, because that's you repaying a loan for your home rather than an expense. Um, it's you repaying a loan, so no. Uh, and also, when you sell your house that you live in, you don't pay any tax on it, so you don't want to erode that at all. So, yeah, um, so a mix of PAY back, and yeah. invoicing jobs. So you might take a share of your rent and your uh, light and heat against the invoicing jobs, an appropriate percentage, but separate from that, you can then take a portion of the working from home that goes into the PAYE expenses, which I'm going to get to if that's okay with you. So you can take it under both strands. Working from home allowance is a new thing that revenue came up with because of COVID. And it was for PAY workers working from their home where they're having to pay for their own uh, Wi-Fi and stuff like that. Is that okay to jump back into it? Yeah. Brilliant, Great. thanks okay. Peter. Um, simple cash book. I was actually gonna share this again, but we looked at that earlier on. So I'm gonna jump on if that's okay with everybody it fed into the same, it kind of fed back into that. And it's just a way of tracking it. Okay, so self-employed and PAY, you can absolutely be both at the same time. And again, it usually won't be up to you. You could be, the best example I can think of is an actor who is doing great on voiceovers, that's always self-employed, and then they get a job in the Abbey, which is always PAYE. Um, to bring it all together, it's just different sections of the tax return. Just, somebody came to me to do a tax return on some rental income they had. And they gave me the rental income information. And then I started doing the return. I said, will you give me your PAY income and any other income they had? And they said to me, but that's already been taxed. I don't need to worry about that. So it occurred to me that it doesn't always, people are not always aware of. When you do a tax return, they look at all of your income again, because they need to know your total income to know what rates to put on the different portions of it. So you add your PAY, which the tax has already been paid on, hopefully, to your self-employed, you work out a total tax bill, and then from that total tax bill, they deduct the PAYE and USC they've already paid through the PAYE system. Does that kind of make some sense? Yeah, okay. So the tax return. If your non-PAYE income after expenses is lower than 5,000, then you can do a simple income tax return on my account. So you don't need to register as self-employed and you don't need to get involved with Roths or Form 11s. So somebody asked me where they were previously PAY and they have some acting income to declare and can they do it as a PAY employee on my account? You can as long as it's lower than five grand. Now you might just do, what normally what people do is usually in the first few years that they're doing self-employed, they get to the end of the year, they look back, they might come to me and say, I have six grand worth of self-employed income. I don't really want to do a Form 11. Let's see. And so I'd say, well, let's see what legitimate expenses we have. Agents, commission, travel, stuff like that. And we get it below five grand. And you can push it all through a, my, through a easy, simple income tax return on my account. That's absolutely no problem. But you won't get hit with self-employed PRSI if that's the case. And if you've got some PAY income and some um, self-employed and you do it through the Form 11, you will get charge PRSI, which will give you some extra credits, and that can be useful to consider. I hope that makes some sort of sense. So if you pay AY, so that's, that's if you, so yeah, just to reiterate that, if your self-employed income is lower than five grand, you can get everything done through my account. If you've been self-employed for the last few years, and then you look back at 2020 and it's lower than five grand, you can deregister from the end of 2019 and re-register from the start of 2021. I'm not sure you'd want to do that, 
but you can do it. It's no problem doing that. Um, your non-PAY income goes into non-PAY income in other income uh, trading profit. So I'm going to log back into uh, my account here. So I'll pack the poor Al Lawrence thing. It's, it's probably going to log me out because I've been gone for a while. So I'll just click into my documents. It's logged me out and I'll log back in. So this is, please, please. Oh. So this is how you go back and add a little bit of self-employed income. And it can only do it if it's less than five grand after expenses. So I go to review my tax, so it has to be after the year end. It'll automatically open up on 2020. And you can just go in to do, first of all, you need to request a preliminary end of year statement. And then once you've done that, it'll let you know if it thinks there's a refund or a tax bill sitting there, and then you can add in everything else. I can't do it for Lauren for 2020, but I can do it back in 2017. This is the same process, and I don't need to go into why I can't do it for 2020. Um, so I've already submitted this in re return. So what I'm going to do at this point in time is I'm just going to amend it. Again, it'll just take me through the same process. So. I click on amend to help you amend. It'll tell me there's some information already in there. If anybody hasn't done this already, this is what it looks like. So you get through the first page, you click next. The next page is gonna have some personal details for Lauren. So I'm gonna do a different share and I'm gonna move on to the bit where I want to show you. Whizzing through this here. Head through that malarkey. All right. Nearly there, nearly there, nearly there. Great, okay. So hopefully you're seeing my account. Yeah, great. So this is the fourth page in this, and this is the page that says other income, so non-PAY non income, and it can be anything. If there's any taxable social welfare, it should already be listed here. In fact, for Lauren, there's a little bit uh, listed there. I just go, yeah, that looks right, and I tick that box. But to add in some non-PAY income, trading income, you go to other income, you go to trading profit, and then you fill in this box. So you just go acting, Commence from the date, just pick the start of the year. Uh, 1st of January, 2017, again, we're looking at that. Just put 31st of the 12th end date. The gross income is before, before any expenses. Let's say Lauren had 2,000, all made up. Uh, it's not share farming. And I'm telling it, it is the adjusted profit. It just asks me, is that a profit or a loss? And I go, yes. And the profit she made after expenses was 1200. Zero, zero. Again, I've just deducted some notional phones and stuff like that. If there was any capital allowances, if Lauren is using a computer to be a actor and we're writing it off at an 800 euro computer off over eight years, we might add in 800, sorry, 100 there. Uh, and then you don't need to worry about the rest of the stuff. And I'll just go add. And now it's added it in there. Tick that. Go to the next page and that will... Let me ask, or let me pick out tax credits. Actually, this is a useful one to go to as well. So you might have some medical expenses. You go in here, you go in here, and I'll go, I had 100 euro of trips to the doctor, prescription medicine, and non-routine dental. And for non-routine dental, I'll put it in a separate box here, which is the really expensive stuff or the more expensive stuff, orthodontistry, periodontistry, gum, root canal, all that stuff. Uh, you usually get a med too from the dentist. I'll say I got 500 and I'll say my insurance company gave me back 50 euro. I'll add that in. Thank you. And uh, is there anything else I need to tell them? Oh, I'm going to say that one of Lauren's PAYE jobs uh, is uh, actor's flat rate. So I'll just add that in here. Actor flat rate. Again, just add it in there. This is doing it after the fact. And again, I'll tick all those. 
and I'll go to the next page and then I'll just click, I look at it all again and I'll sign and submit. So that is where somebody who is not registered for, uh, as a self-employed person can add in self-employed income into the My Account. Does that make some sort of sense for the people who are asking that question? Okay, I think that's okay. Great. So again, you uh, if your non-income, non-POI income non income is above five grand, then you need to register for income tax with revenue. You can register for income tax via my account. So let's go back to my account and look at what that looks like. So this is where you go. Uh, I'm going to go to my account documents just to get me out of here. Back to my doc account. Okay, so somebody knows they're, they're, they're now in April 2021 and they know that their self employed income in 2020 was higher than five grand after expenses and they need to let revenue know they're, they're registered for income tax. This is how they do it. They go down here to the pink box, I think it is, and they go to tax registrations. And then they go, I want to register for income tax. The date the business, they've decided it's first to the first. 2020, even though, you know, they might have got sent out the first fee invoice. I just picked the first of the first 2020 because that means you can start deducting expenses from the first of the first 2020. It may not be correct, but to be honest, it's not going to make much of a difference. I'm going to say acting. And I'm going to, this is the only thing that might trip people up that might not have seen before. The rest of it's all pretty common sense. This is a classification code. So I'm just going to go in here. Uh, it's going to show me that I need to tell them what type of business I'm starting. I've checked this many times. I can't find acting in it, but I can find artist. So I'll do artist. I go down here. I know that I scroll to the second last page, but I need to get to the last page. Go back one, and I've got, oh, back to two, and I'll just pick, oh, artist own account. Again, it's only for information purposes. It doesn't ever show up again. So if you stuck down plumber, I don't think anybody even noticed any difference. Lauren is not going to have a trading name, so she's fine there. I checked that. That looks okay. They'll ask for what you think your income is going to be for the next 12 months, for the first 12 months. I'm doing it in April 2021, so I know, say, Lauren earned 15 grand uh, before expenses. The reason they're looking for that is they want to check to see that you shouldn't be registered for VAT, which is 37,500. If you put in 100 grand in there, they're going to send you back a letter saying, I think you need to register for VAT as well. I'll say that Lauren is single. You can only do this if you're the accessible spouse. If you're married and one of you is the accessible spouse, you might. if you're currently a PAYE person and you don't know who it is, you might need to ring revenue and ask them. And um, if you are the if you're not the accessible spouse, you do it through the accessible spouse is my account. And in the uh, description name, you put spouse acting. So I'm going to take that. Yes. It then asked me for my uh, address and my contact details. I click next, I put in the password, and Lauren is now registered for income tax uh, on Revenue System. That sound okay? That's it. They'll send you a letter in about 48 hours with your income tax number, which will be your PPS number. So we've gone through the thing. I'm watching the clock here. Um, so we have, let me just move you guys down over here. Okay. So you can register for income tax via my account, what we just looked at, uh, and we've just done that. So once registered for income tax, you then need to register for Ross to do a Form 11 tax return because it's a separate thing. It's like registering for income tax is the equivalent of opening a bank account. Registering for Ross is the equivalent of registering for online banking. It's just a platform through which you do it. So once you get that letter back in the post or via my account, I think, you then have your income tax number, which is your PPS number, then you can register for income tax. So I'm going to now show you how you register for, sorry, register for Ross. Me speaking too fast. Um, again, just moving out of the way. So this is now somebody registering for Ross. You go to just re Google Register for Ross. It's on Revenue's website, but Register for Ross is the best place to get it. Um, so the step one is you apply for your revenue access number. Basically, you go in here. You're replying as an individual. The tax type is income tax. You just register for income tax. Now you need to get a, a Ross cert. And then you put in your number. I'm going to put in my number. 
it's going to tell me that I already have one. Revenue likes to take its time, especially when it knows I'm under time pressure and giving class. My tech has already failed more than one occasion. Come on, don't let me down. You're killing me. Yeah, there's already an active roster for this registration, blah, 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 blah. So that's totally fine. But what you'll get is you'll get a message to say you have now, I'm going to go back one page, you have now registered you have now you're now going to be sent out a ran which is a rev ross access number in the post once you get a ross access number you then go to this bit you apply for your digital certificate you put in the number you've just been sent out by post and it will then uh, send you out a password and so part three then is you go to download and save your certificate because you now have a password. It downloads a physic physical, it downloads a digital certificate to your laptop, usually to your downloads folders, and you just need to move it to a folder on your laptop to make sure that the next time you clear out your downloads, you don't lose it. Does that make sense? That's a lot, uh, there's a lot in there. You might need to kind of, if you haven't done that already, you might need to kind of work through it. But basically it's a three-step process. It usually takes a bit of time, like maybe a week or so. So you don't want to do it two days before the tax return deadline. So um, back to here. So Ross, now to log into Ross, the moment some of us have been waiting for. Up here, new share. So. Hopefully you're seeing uh, my Google Chrome. I use Google Safari for most things. It's a bit glitchy on Ross, so I use Chrome for Ross. So first thing you do is you go to Revenue's website again. As you can see, I'm averse to typing in anything in the search in the actual address bar and do everything via my Google. So I sign into Ross and it will pick up the certificates you have on your folder. If you have been using this and all of a sudden it stops working, but you know you've got a certificate on your laptop, what you need to do is go up and search on your laptop for a file that's called .p12.bac. You take a note of that or I'll add it into the notes or something, .p12.bac. And if there's a certificate on your laptop, that's where it'll find it under that. And you might just need to move it to where somewhere you can find it again here in manage my certificates. But mine's in good place here. So I'm gonna log in as myself. And this is what Ross looks like. So we've got a lot of stuff on here, some of which won't show up on your one. I happen to be a registered employer for the tax side of things. So you, if you're not a registered employer, you won't see that. But everybody should see who's registered for income tax should see this page here. So what we're trying to do now is uh, do a tax return on revenue system. So strap yourself in. So I'm going to do the complete form online, income tax, select a type, form 11, file a return. It's going to tell me I've started one already. I started one last night. I've wiped out all my personal information. So this is just uh, information for teaching purposes. So uh, I've started one. So all I need to do is click edit. Or if I had remembered that from the start, and I deliberately didn't so I could take you through the process. When you start one, you can go into work in progress at any point and it'll pick up the stuff you've started working on. So it's sitting in there and I'll just click edit. Again, revenue likes to take its time. The spinning wheel up there is all good. So on the first page, you always need to get through the first page uh, to get to open up all of these other over here. It'll always be pre-tick to whatever it was last year for that and that. And if you've done at least one return, that box will be ticked. But if it's not ticked, you'll have to tick it. It's just asking you, are you a high earner? If you earn more than 150 grand, you're a high earner. If you don't, just tick no. I'll click continue. On this second page, it'll ask me, do I have a health, a met? There's, sorry, I should have said at the start, there's like two, 400 pieces of information in this return. I'm just going to pick the bits that I need for someone who's got a, PA, a bit of PAYE income and a bit of self-employed income and perhaps some medical expenses, and that's it. The rest of it, rental income, uh, foreign income, again, we'll touch on that briefly, 
uh, and other stuff like that, pension contributions. You can find them within this. It's just beyond the scope of this two hour chat. But basically, if you're self-employed with a bit PAYE, you can get away with the personal details, self-employed, PAYE, PAYE, and the credits. In fact, for this one, I included a bit of temporary wage support subsidy, in case that was relevant to anyone, and also a bit of pop income, in case that was relevant. So, on this page usually, this is the second personal details. If you've got a medical card, tick the box there, otherwise don't. It'll always pre-populate residency, ordinarily residence and domicility from the previous year. So if you've never done one before, you might have to take these. Residency very broadly is you've been in the country for more than 183 days in the year. Ordinarily residency very broadly is you've been resident for the past three years in a row up to, but not including this year. So to be ordinarily resident in 2021, sorry, 2020, that's the return we're doing, 2020. Um, you need to have been resident in 2019, 18 and 17. And domicility, very, very broadly, is you were born in this country and you intend to stay in this country. If that's not the case, you might need to look at it. If you weren't born here but intend to stay here, you probably are domiciled. Again, this is relevant if you've got foreign income that you're not bringing into the country. That's the main reason it's relevant. But most people on the call will be resident, ordinarily resident and domiciled. What doesn't seem to be pre-ticked each year is where, which country you are a national of. So for a lot of people, they will be a national of Ireland. Some people will be a national of Ireland and the UK. You could be both. No problem with that. Revenue have only started to track these things in the last few years. Again, it's all tied into sharing information with different jurisdictions and stuff like that. And that is all you need to worry about on this page as long as you're resident and doing a resident return. Anything beyond that is beyond the scope of this call. So then we pop into the PAY section. Usually the PAY section will be pre-populated already with um, all the information that revenue has on PAY jobs you have. It, there might be a number of them here and you might have like view employments for four different ones. All you need to usually do is go in Check the numbers seem about right. You can check them to the final pay slip because you no longer get P60s, P45s. And all you usually have to do is tick this box, change it from nothing in it to employment. That's usually all you need to do. And this is just made up details. This person, um, Peter Daly, has earned six grand to this made up company and they've paid some tax and some USC. But also the employer put them on temporary wage support subsidy and that's showing up here. They're going to find out now that that is a taxable payment that hasn't been taxed already and it might just distort the picture for 2020. So I click that all looks okay. On any one of these pages, if you go down the bottom and click save, it brings you back up to the next page. So that's fine. I'm going to say that that PAYE job that that person had was an acting job and they have some agents commission on that. So this is where you put agents commission and also acting flat rate on PAY income. Those are generally the only deductions against acting PAY income. So I'm going to go acting, uh, agents and flat rate. And I'm going to say that the flat rate is 750 because I know the actor's flat rate is 750. And I'm going to go all other expenses is 10% of 600 plus a bit of VAT. Let's say it was 720. I'm, I'm looking at the, I'm pretending to look at the actual commission statement rather than making up numbers. But if you can't find it and you know what it was roughly, putting in an estimate is not going to screw you. Because even if they come back and you have to go to your agent and get the number, it's not going to change by that much. But if it's if it's a big pay, it's a big job, like say you got 40 grand on a TV production and you can't find the thing, it's worth going back and getting that. But for, you know, for two weeks work and you know there was an agent's commission, you can stick it in there. Someone asked about e-working, working from home. This is where it goes and it's a really miserly calculation. It's the number of days and you can Google this. It's a number of days you work from home as a PAY worker. So your employer sent you home, you work from home. Number of days you work from home, that might be around 200 over 365 days in the year multiplied by your light and heat for the year multiplied by 10%. If you work that out, it's going to give you like 30 or 40 euro. It's going to take you half an hour to work it out. I would just stick down 50 euro. You can also take the same calculation by 30% by your internet. So the number of days you work from home for 365 multiplied by your internet bill multiplied by 30%. Do the calculation. And when I was saying uh, just stick in an estimate, of course I was joking. Click calculate. Then go check the number there, 1470, and then make sure you type it in here. Because if you don't type it in there, it's not going to pick it up. And also, 
just to show you how revenue is sometimes a bit glitchy. If I go, oh, actually the agent's commission is 800. Calculate, and it'll bring me back down here. It will won't have updated this. So you need to make sure you update it as you go. Okay, so that's where for any of the actors on the call who have agent's commission on PAY work and the flat rate, that's where that goes. And you need to include it there even if it's already been given, even if the flat rate has already been given through the job, through like their tax credit certificate. Okay, so this PUP, if you had any PUP or taxable social welfare, it should be, there should be a little green box there that gives you all of the taxable social welfare. It'll give you the number and you just transcribe it down there. I didn't have any pup in the year, so it hasn't given me that. But uh, it long, it sometimes might happen, particularly years, a few years ago where revenue system wasn't as integrated with welfare system, where someone would say to me, look, I know there's nothing showing up in it, but I know I had a thousand worth of job seekers benefit. And well, I'll just type in the thousand there. So that's where pup goes. As long as there's nothing else going on. And again, you can read through all these and go whatever. But, you know, these are the, the most of the things I come across. So we filled in this person's personal details. We filled in their PAYE. We've just checked the details and we put in any agent's commission and flat rate. And we've also confirmed the PUP by transcribing the number down. So now we want to put in the self-employed income. You might recall that I had that little um, income and expenditure um, and it had 1855 of taxable income. So I've just used those same numbers again to fill in this page. So 1850 goes there and it also goes there. The reason it looks for it twice is that if you have a loss, the loss goes there and you put in zero there and you don't have anything in there. But I do have a profit, so I have nothing there. I'm 18550. And just to de just demonstrate something that revenue has, it's quite useful. Say I put in zero there and I get to the bottom of the page, which I'm going to go over. It'll tell me you can't have values in both places. It's really good if you're not sure how to fill this out and you've got time. Just get stuck in. You'll make a ton of mistakes. You'll miss asterisks where it tells you you have to have values, but it will always point out where they are. And you can just go down, find it, and get rid of it. So uh, another kind of um, maxim I have for doing this tax return is that if you're looking at a box and it doesn't sound familiar or make sense or say anything to your life, you can just ignore it. Farm details, doesn't sell anything. Start your own business relief is now gone. Balancing charge is too complicated for this. Unused capital allowance is unlikely, but I should, might have capital allowances for the year. This is where you let them know about the laptop you're writing off over eight years or your car that you might be writing off over eight years at a business proportion. Or if somebody's got some studio equipment that costs a lot of money or recording equipment, let's say above 500, maybe above a thousand, they might include it here. If th that expense is included here, it can't be included in the net number here. I think that makes sense. Skipping on down, losses, stuff like that, that can be relevant, but if you've got losses, maybe talk to an accountant or drop me a line or something like that. But this is the meat on the bones, really. This is where I take that income and expenditure and I transcribe it in here. So I've got 1st of January, 2020 to the 31st, so far so good, I'll ignore all these bits here. This is where I put my sales and other income. So I'm gonna pretend that I got a 5,000 agility award from the Arts Council, here's hoping. Um, and the rest of it was me sending out invoices for 225, and that got me that 27,500 that was in that income and expenditure. I then need to split it out. This is what I'm talking about when I say revenue look for specific amounts. Motor traveling, they look for subcontractors, they look for professional fees, they look for motor traveling assistance, repairs, renewals, rental, then they look for some, to ignore those, and they look for everything else to be lumped in there. If you don't fill in any of those boxes, it'll tell you you need to, apart from this one, because in a lot of cases here, you can only have a positive or a negative. So that's why I've left that free. This is new in the 2020 return. You hit calculate. It brings them to the top of the page and you go back down to make sure that this is actually the amount you have. Previously, you just used to key that in. I'm going to say there'll be no adjustments because I've already made the adjustments like I haven't included personal stuff. So I'm not taking out any motor expenses. You can do it the other way, include all the original numbers up here and make an adjustment out, but this is just keeps it simple and revenue will be happy with you for this. Then click calculate. And then just assume back down here that anything you earned, you took out of the business as a drawing. So just key in the same amount there and put a zero there and the only two other two boxes that need to be filled in. And then click save. Take it to the top of the page, make sure there's no red writing. And that's how you populate a self-employed panel if, there are, if there's no more complicating factors. 
The type of complicated, complicating factors you might see is professional services withholding tax, which I think was Mary Lou asked about that. So if you did a job for somebody who's obliged to withhold professional services withholding tax, a university or a county council often do that, they should give you a certificate. So say you bill them for a thousand euro and they've deducted 200 euro. You put that down in here, 200 euro. And that'll give you a credit for that in the final calculation. Does that make sense? Okay. Would that be similar for an agent, Peter? You know, so a writer getting an invoice and then the agent takes their fee or is that slightly different? No, it's slightly different. What I would expect to see in that case is if somebody was doing it technically correct, mm -hmm. they would include the gross income, the total income before any deductions up at the top part of the income expenditure and then the agent's commission down below. To be honest, if, if that person's income is below the VAT threshold of 37500 and they just included the net amount up above and ignored the commission, it's the same answer anyway, that would be fine. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so having put all this in, I now think I'm ready to hit calculate. And this is where I get the good or bad news. So I hit calculate. It's going to tell me. And if I, if I haven't filled in all the panels here, it'll tell me go in and uh, fill them in. So that just bit is up there because some income is treated differently for USC uh, than for income tax. It's going to list my income again. So I had uh, self-employed. I had emoluments is another word for PAYE. I had Department of Social Protection up there, and I had um, twelve hundred not subject. This is the temporary wage support subsidy. My total income is thirty seven thousand five hundred. From that, I deduct my capital allowances through the self employed side, plus also my five fifty and agents commission, um, giving me taxable income of thirty six thousand one hundred. As I say, the first I now it now looks to tax it in three different ways. So. The first, I might just ask my um, associate to turn down the telly just a little bit. Louise, did that answer that, that question for you? Yeah, great. Thanks, everyone. So, as I said, the first cut off, first 35,300 is at 20%, and the bit above that is at 40%, and then it deducts the tax credits. Sorry, I forgot to go into the tax credits page. Give me a second. Over here is where the tax credits go. You always need to go in there, even if you are doing the return and nothing has changed. You just make sure you've got that 1650. If there's nothing in that box, just hit the calculate. If you're married, it'll give you 3300. If you're married and it's a joint assessment return, you always make sure you take the employee and the earned income. Earned income is a self-employed credit. Even if you have none of that source, either source in any year, just keep them ticked. Because if, if, if you've no PAY and you aren't in the habit of ticking that, and then you have some PAY, it'll be automatically pre-ticked. And then I'm just gonna skip, but this is where you can go and see is anything else relevant. And then you go down the very bottom of the page and it'll give you your health expenses. So I'm just gonna put in, 200 euro worth of trips to the doctor, prescription medicine, and non-routine dental. I click calculate, it'll bring me to the top of the page. And then I go over here and hit calculate. Great, so income tax is the first of the three taxes. This is this bit here. So we've got that 7380 before credits, I deduct the credits and that will give me my net income tax liability on all of this income. I then click the show button to see how it's treating me for USC. It's going to take in the self-employed and the PAY and the T temporary wage support subsidy, but you uh, social welfare payments, the PUP or job seekers benefit, don't get hit with USC. So it's a lower taxable bill. It'll take off the 100 euro, but it won't take off the agent's commission. That's only deductible against income tax. You get used to these variations as you go. So the first 12,000 at 0.5, the next at that, next at that. So my USC bill, the second part of the puzzle is 461. Then PRSI, it gets, again, there's another variation here. It'll only pick up the self-employed. It doesn't pick up the PAYE. And it doesn't take it, pick up the temporary wage support subsidy. And it doesn't pick up the PUP. Um, the reason it doesn't pick up the PAYE is that's already been paid through the PAYE system. You've been deducted PRSI there already. Um, so there we go. All in there, 4%, 738. So my total tax bill is uh, the three taxes, 7380, 461, 738, less the credits, less the amount I paid through the PAYE system, 
PAY and USC, unless my withholding tax given me 4890, uh, that's the credits reliefs. So it's that number, less that. So my net tax bill, if I was ready to submit this right now, that's what I think I'm paying. So I click save. You need to go into this one here, IT self-assessment panel. It'll just give you the same information again. That's down that side. There's a five-step process here. You click yes, I agree with that. You transfer the values over. You then type in whatever you paid in preliminary tax here. It's the only number that doesn't transfer over. You declare the above to be what you uh, declare to be your self-assessment and you click save. This might seem like, well, what am I doing here? All they're doing is revenue is asking you to take, to, to uh, actively take ownership of the numbers they put through the return. So you can't go back to them and say, well, you told me what I owed. They go, no, we showed you what we think you owe. You had to say you agreed with it. They figured that out after about three years of doing this return. You click save and then you submit it. So I'm, I'm owing 3689. I click sign and submit. There's usually a page that comes up here that's not coming up for me for some reason. I checked it last night, I'm not sure. It's where you can key in the amount of tax you're paying and the amount of preliminary tax you're paying. It's not coming up for me, it's not a big deal. But I'll just say, okay, I'm gonna pay it by a Ross debit instruction. I've set up my bank details on the front page. Whatever it was, 3685 at 3685, might not be exactly that. I'm gonna pay it on the 31st of the 10th, 2021. I'm gonna click next. Check the details there. Is that the amount? Is that the bank detail? Click OK. And as with everything with revenue, until you put in the password, it's just theoretical. So I am conscious of time and questions. Um, but hopefully that's useful for anybody who's been looking at a tax return and not been able to uh, crack it. Deadlines and penalties. I'm going to whiz through all this stuff because it's, it's going to be available in the notes. So 31st of October for a paper return. Nobody can do paper returns. They make you do an online return. There's usually extended by a couple of weeks. If you file and pay, you can't just file and not pay online via Ross, but they haven't given it yet this year. They still might. Um, if, what happens if you miss the deadline? Not that bad. 5% surcharge on whatever tax is owing. So if you get it in by the 31st of December. So say you owe two grand and you get it in on the 15th of December, they're going to hit you with a surcharge of 100 euro. Not the end of the year. Not the end of the world. If you leave it beyond the 31st of October, you get hit by a 10% surcharge, but then it stays at that. Now, there's always the chance you might get hit with an interest charge, but to be honest, revenue don't tend to start applying interest unless they're ch chasing you for returns and tax bills and all that stuff. If you've got no tax bill or a refund, there's no late filing penalty. So don't be breaking your heart to get a return in by the 31st of October when it's a refund, if you've got other things to do, like a show in the festival. Preliminary tax, just let's talk about it. Revenue expects you to pay some tax for 2021 by the 31st of October, 2021. Often smaller self-employed people are completely ignored and nothing ever really happens. But if, you, uh, if, you're, if your tax bill is higher, revenue can hit you with an interest charge for non-payment of preliminary tax. But just so you know, the rule is you're supposed to pay some by this year and technically the amount you're supposed to pay is the lower of last year's tax bill, which is the 2020 tax bill, or 90% of whatever the 2021 tax bill turns out to be, which is a guess at, by the 31st of October. Again, if you're not sure about that one, if you've never done it, Google it, ask people around if they ever done it, has anything bad ever happened? Revenue audits and other interventions. What's the worst that can happen? So revenue, uh, I mentioned briefly, revenue, um, it's, it's, it's known as a tax geared uh, penalty regime, which means that the penalties are geared around the tax you didn't pay. So if your mistakes are minor and they're accidental and you're just whatever, revenue are very unlikely to hit you with a rap on the knuckles. They might do something like that, but they won't. What normally happens is that the, on the lowest scale, you might get a query from revenue. This is known as an aspect query, where they might ask you for backup for your medical expenses, or they might ask you to explain something else. This is a routine thing, and it doesn't mean anything bad's gonna happen, but it can be an indication that they're looking at you. The next level up is a revenue audit. At this stage of the game, if you get a letter to say you're being audited, they, there's a good chance they think something might be wrong. And they'll also start the clock ticking. They're going to tell you, tell you, we're going to revenue audit you, I think it's 60 days. 
within that 60 days, you can go and take a look at your conscience and your record keeping and go, fuck, I should have told them about that ad I did two years ago for 20 grand. And if you come clean about it before the revenue starts, um, you're uh, cooperating with them and they will reduce the um, penalty regime to the lowest possible. You'd still get hit with a penalty, but it'll be the lowest possible. That's known as a a qualifying voluntary disclosure. So if you get a letter, letter for revenue audit and you know there's some suspect stuff just talk to an accountant and they'll pull it together for you if you've been doing it on your own or talk to your own accountant. And basically what you do is you redo everything. You have the um, letter to say, I did wrong and here's the tax I should have paid and here's a check with the tax and the interest from the day I should have paid it and that makes it a qualifying voluntary disclosure. If you get a letter to say that you're being inspected, a revenue inspection, you're in big trouble. That's when things are really bad. That's the highest slash lowest level of intervention. That, all I say to you is that if keep an eye on your income figure from self-employed activity, don't include bursaries or project funding in your own name or don't include PAY income. And if it's going above 37,500 or you know it will, you probably need to register for VAT. I would suggest just talk to an accountant. Again, people sometimes come to me, shit, I've got 20 grand worth of self-employed income and 20 grand worth of PAY. We can ignore the PAY, it's not relevant. Artist exemption, very broadly, up to 15,000 of income from the sale of art can be exempt from the first of the three taxes, income tax, that 20%, 40% one. You need to apply before the end of the tax year to be eligible from the start of that tax year. So if you've written a book in 2021, you start to get money from it in 2021, you need to make that application by the 31st of December 2021 to be applicable to the earnings in 2021. You can get it for writing, it's two different categories, a play or a book and other writing, composing, painting or sculpture. So far you can't get it for anything else, but there's lobbying going on. USC and PRSI will still apply to that income. Anything else? Useful links. Okay, let's open it up to a few questions. Sorry about the crazy um, uh, speed at the end. Ah, where do you insert arts bursary that is artist exempt? Absolutely really good question. I should have looked at it. Let me go really quickly back to share the screen. I'd say this um, Google is probably still open. Yeah, and I'll just go out of here. And I'll go back into work in progress. So if you are uh, are exempt artist and you've got the letter from revenue to say you are now exempt, what you do is you can report the income and expenditure in the self-employed activity but just put a zero for the taxable bit at the start. And then you can include the income here. Exempt income, artist exempt. Say I put in 5,000 and I click save. I go back to the calculate button. And now that 5,000 doesn't appear in the income tax calculation. It's not in there, but it is in there, artist exemption and it is in their artist exemption. And bursaries are the same. And from bursaries, you can deduct legitimate expenses to give you the bit that is your artist exempt. If you apply for a bursary and get one and you don't have artist exemption uh, and you haven't applied for it and you don't get it for that same thing, for example, if you've got a bursary to write a play and you don't yet have it, you can apply for it and then that bursary is artist exempt. But if you don't have it, it just gets treated in with your other income. Just gets included in your other income. Somebody said, off my, sorry, yeah. Actually, I was going to say, there's one here, actually, the, uh, the VAT threshold of 37,500. Does that mean gross income, including expenses? And so just for context, the yeah. expenses for this person could be quite high because they're employing musicians, et cetera, but the profit quite low. Yeah, and that's a really good question. And unfortunately, it's the, it's the sale number. It's the turnover figure. It's, it technically, VAT is a income on the sale of services or on the sale of goods. So what you look at is your service as a producer or as a facilitator or as a musician or as an artist. How much am I sending out in invoices? How much am I getting in? And that can be really distorted when you're taking money for other people. So it's a tricky one I sometimes find. Um, yeah, because technically the correct answer there is it's the income figure you look at. Mm-hmm. But maybe there's ways around that. Maybe you can send the uh, the venue or whatever, like four different invoices for four different people. It's a pain in the hole. Are they going to go on? Oh, we can't be dealing with that. I don't know. Yeah. 
I feel there should be ways around it, but technically that's that's the rule. It's the it's effectively your invoices you're sending out. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you split income over two years if it pertains to an activity that is happening in two different financial years but is drawn down in one? Absolutely. And sorry, that was one of the questions I meant to cover when we were doing the income and expenditure. My feeling on that is, yeah, absolutely. Um, now, if you are doing a set of financial statements for a company, they have very strict rules about how grant is grants are um, distributed, but we're not. We're just producing a set of management accounts from which we produce an uh, income and expenditure account to do a tax return. My feeling is absolutely. you get Because it doesn't make any sense at all. You might get 12 grand in for from the Arts Council in December for activity that's going to happen the following year. So in that case, it makes absolutely sense to push all of it into the next year. So following that logic, I feel no, there's no problem doing half in one year and half the following, as long as you can kind of make sense of it if there is a revenue query. Mm. Um, for someone who's just moved to Ireland, they don't have a PPS number as yet, should they still register for self-employment and can they register? Yeah, you need to register for a PPS number first and then register for a PPS number as a non-resident. They'll go through the hoops where are you allowed to work and stuff like that. And then having done that, then you can register as self-employed. And then for the artist exemption, is it the same for the project award when paying other people? I'm not entirely certain. I sorry, Claire. Can I could I get you to just maybe tell us a little? No, bit apologies. I was just because you're paying yourself a writer's fee and then paying other people who might be yeah. other professions, composers, and I know you've, you you told us about paying other people, but I'm just I didn't Absolutely. actually apply for myself. Like, but it wouldn't Absolutely. be till next year. I suppose you'd be claiming yeah. it. You know what I mean? I feel absolutely there's no problem in that. It is part of, particularly if in the original project funding application, you have a line that says artist fee and it's that amount, or sorry, uh, play, playwrights fee or whatever. Mm. Yeah, I think there's no problem with that. Brilliant. Um, I, what I might do is I might formally close this, so like in recording and, and everything, and then if there's people wanted to stay on for a minute or two for a question. But before I do, I just wanted to put in, well, first of all, to say a massive thank you to everybody for joining us this morning. And a huge thank you to Peter. Um, it was a lot of information to go through. I hope everyone had strong coffee with them. But if you didn't catch bits outside of the wonderful notes that Peter is going to share, there is also the opportunity to watch it back on our YouTube channel because we will put it up there because we appreciate it. My be something that there's a couple of parts that you need to revisit um, and then to give you guys a announcement that we haven't put up online yet which is our next information session is contract and rights with media lawyer Andrea Martin next Wednesday um, so I'm going to put in the link here as well to register for that but if you've been registered for Accelerate you'll hear about it by email so apologies for cross-posting thank you so much Catherine I might ask you to stop recording now